Good evening. Thank you for joining us again this evening. And I trust you've uh, got your Bibles ready. Looking forward to a time of worship. Appreciate that so much. And here at Ripley Tabernacle Baptist Church, we're thrilled that you've been able to tune in or uh, be with us for this time. I would like to open our service in a word of, pr word of prayer. And um, in thinking about that, I'm thinking about um, our nation and all that we're going through. And I, I just, my heart just goes out to those families that are really struggling. Uh, whether they have had a loss of a loved one, maybe a loss of a job, going through difficult times. And then I think about those that are working hard. Um, many right now have had some time off and our schedules have changed and maybe we're getting some tasks done. You know, things are different definitely in our life, but there are some that have not stopped. Matter of fact, that's been probably ramped up. They've worked longer hours. They put themselves even at risk. And I really, I really appreciate that. And I want to make sure that we uphold them in prayer and on a regular daily basis and they got to give them strength and, and help them during this time. But let's go to prayer right now for that and that the Lord would uh, bless this service. Heavenly Father, we love you. Thank you that we can once again meet again, meet and be in this place. And uh, Lord, I pray you'd bless the special music. Lord, uh, as we have offering, as we preach your word, may you be pleased with that. Thank you for those that are out uh, helping us right now, fighting off this pandemic we're in and this, this virus. I pray you'd give them strength. And I think about even those that are in the service industry helping and waiting on people and making sure we have the things we need. May you help them in a special way. Bless your word tonight as we get into that. I pray you'd get the honor and the glory from it. Well, thank you in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Well, you've joined us and tuned in this evening. Thank you so much. Wednesdays at 7 o'clock. And then following that, we'll have a prayer time. Pastor Mike does that. Then also, the teens, they have something on Thursdays as well as other days. And Pastor Josh doing a great job with that. We appreciate our young people and appreciate Pastor Josh and Miss Emily uh, taking care of that. Sunday morning, Sunday school at 9.30. And then uh, morning worship at 10.30. Sunday evenings at 6 o'clock. So tune in whenever you can. I hope and pray that you're setting this uh, time aside with your family or with your Bibles there in your homes and um, just having the time to worship. And I trust that'll be a blessing to you. Right now we have special music and I trust that'll be a blessing. Sing like never before. 
Thank you so much. I appreciate the music and appreciate those that will sing and honor Christ uh, with their voices and in the, in the form of music. Well, I've asked Brother Clarence, usually on Wednesday evenings, we would have our prayer time. And we're doing that a little different on Wednesdays now. Uh, after the services, we have that Facebook live. Pastor Mike does that. But I've asked Brother Clarence if he would come and just pray for tonight's service. Pray that God would bless. Pray for the message. Pray that... Um, the Lord would uh, help our our nation and heal our land of this uh, this virus, and just have a special word of prayer. So, Brother Clarence, why don't you, if you would, come at this time and just lead us in prayer? God bless you. Well, good evening. Good evening. We are we here at the Ripley Tabernacle Church. We usually have our prayer request and our praise time before our Wednesday night service, but during this time, we have to do things just a little different. But let's not forget that Pastor Mike will be doing prayer requests live tonight after our evening service on, on Facebook. If, if you can uh, tune in right at the end of that service, Pastor Mike will be doing that live, and it's, it's a really good thing. Let's not forget to pray for our country, our country's leaders, especially for our first responders. And really, really, especially for the ones that have, those families that have lost a loved one during this very difficult time. And I know it has to be difficult at this time. Let's not only remember our nation leaders, but our local leaders as well. Let's pray for all the doctors and the nurses working all those extra hours to hope those battling this terrible virus. And let's praise God for those that have recovered Precious Heavenly Father, God, we know that you're an all-wise and all-knowing God. And God, we just want to thank you for our country. We pray for our countries and our country leaders, Lord. And, and God, we just ask that you just pray for our, our, our doctors, our nurses, and our first responders, Lord, that fearlessly work with the, the sick individuals, Lord, who are battling this terrible virus, God. And, and Lord, we just ask, Heavenly Father, Lord, that you would just touch them, keep them safe. And God, we just ask, Lord, that you just uh, be with our church here to, to in, in the future, Lord. Uh, we don't know what the future is, but God, we know that you do. We know that you, you're in charge. We miss church coming to service, Lord, and see the faces of our loved ones here in our church, our Sunday school class. We ask, Lord, that you just protect us in our church, our elderly folks. Dear Heavenly Father, God, just be with those and Keep them safe. Keep them in, Lord, as, as much as you can, Lord. And, and uh, God, we just ask you and follow the Lord that, uh, <clears throat> that you just be with the, our, our choir, dear God, that, that, that was working so very hard on a, on a cantata. Dear and Father, Lord, and, and Brother Jeff, and, and Lord, we just ask, dear Lord, that you just 
be with our choir as they sing, dear God. And we miss seeing all of our, the, the regular congregation and our pastors, dear Heavenly Father, Lord. And, and, as, and as I look across the, the empty auditorium, Lord, I, I, st- I see people's faces, Lord, that uh, we request prayer in my mind's eye, dear Lord. And, and uh, Wednesday night is our family night. And uh, we, we express praise. And, and God, we just ask, dear Heavenly Father, Lord, that you just uh, end this terrible virus soon. Be with our families, God, and be with our country. Lord, and we'll never fail to give you the praise and glory and honor for it all in Jesus' holy name, because we love you, and amen.
Amen. Thank you, Brother Clarence, and also thank you for the special music. I appreciate it. Get your Bibles, Luke chapter 24, Luke chapter 24. I'll tell you what's been on my heart this evening is um, we, we speak of Easter and, boy, the importance of Easter, Resurrection Sunday for, for a believer, for a child of God. And, and a lot of times, if we're not careful, we'll spend about a week, maybe a Sunday and a Wednesday and a Sunday, and talk about the resurrection and preach about it. And then we pretty much move on. We leave from there and, and go our separate ways and go other places in God's Word, which is good. But I want to tarry a little bit, and we'll look at that, that word here just in a few minutes. It says in, in verse 49 of Luke 24, it talks about tarry until, and I want to look at that thought here just a little bit. Some of the events that took place after the resurrection and... Um, Boy, before the church was this, it was established and the Holy Spirit came and, and did a great work. And I want to look at that for just a little bit this evening. You know, Jesus is expounding on the events of his life here in Luke chapter 24. And let's begin in verse 36, Luke 24 and verse 36, and read through the end of the chapter just to kind of get a, a feeling for where we are in, in, in the setting of things. It says in Luke 24, verse 36... And as they thus spake, Jesus himself stood in the midst of them and saith unto them, Peace be unto you. But they were terrified and affrighted, and supposed that they had seen a spirit. And he said unto them, Why are ye troubled? And why do thoughts arise in your hearts? Behold my hands and my feet, that it is I myself. Handle me and see, for a spirit hath not flesh and bones as ye see me have." And when he had thus spoken, he showed them his hands and his feet. And while they yet believed not for joy and wondered, he said unto them, Have ye here any meat? And they gave him a piece of rolled fish and of a honeycomb, and he took it and did eat before them. And he said unto them, These are the words which I spake unto you while I was yet with you that all things must be fulfilled which were written in the law of Moses and in the prophets and in the Psalms concerning me. Verse 45, Then opened he their understanding that they might understand the Scriptures, and saith unto them, Thus is written, and thus it behooved Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead the third day, and that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in His name among all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. And ye are witnesses of these things. And behold, I send the promise of my Father upon you. Tear ye in the city of Jerusalem until ye be endued with power from on high. And he led them out as far as to Bethany, and he lifted up his hands and blessed them. And it came to pass while he blessed them, he was parted from them and carried up into the heaven. And they worshipped him and returned to Jerusalem with great joy. And they were continually in the temple praising and blessing God. Amen. Let's pray as we look at this thought this evening, tarry until. Lord, bless your word. Thank you for it. Help me to say what's needed. God, I pray that we'll think about the application here and these men that tarried and, and prayed and worshipped. And Lord, may we be found doing the same thing. We love you and thank you in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Well, as I think about this passage, he's been teaching them even before the text that I read. Um, and he's um, talking about the disciples and the Great Commission and what's, what's needful. They're going to be teaching and uh, it's important. It's found in Matthew 28, verses 19 and 20. And after this, he tells them to wait in Jerusalem until that they're endued or clothed upon with power from... Almighty from power from heaven, then Jesus ascends up into glory. So they have this conversation and they spend this time with him and then he ascends up into glory. Pretty amazing when you think about it. Pretty amazing. Now, now here we are more than 2,000 years later. We're organized, we have buildings, we have music, we have pews, we have lights, have all the, all the surroundings, all the things, and preachers, and multiple copies of God's Word. We have all those things, everything we need to impact this world for Jesus. But it seems we miss the one thing 
that will help us get the job done. We miss that one thing. That's the power of God. The power of God. Sometimes I wonder, why do we not have the power of God like we should? Why does it seem like there's um, lots of effort and, and, and not enough power? Well, I wonder sometimes if we just haven't carried out the Lord's command in our own lives, maybe we've not tarried until we're endued. Maybe we've not spent that time begging and asking God for His power to help us. And that's what I want to look at this evening for a little while. I believe it's a great need for each of us as individuals, a great need in our churches, that we be filled with and endued with the power of God. So let's focus on it just a little bit. The first thing I want to notice is tarry until God's promise is fulfilled. Now, amid all the news and all the talking, suddenly in verses 36 and 37, Jesus appears in their midst. Now think about that. Look at verse 36. Luke 24, verse 36. And as they thus spake, Jesus himself stood in the midst of them and saith unto them, Peace be unto you. But they were terrified and affrighted and supposed they had seen a spirit. He didn't come up the stairs and knock on the door. He didn't, uh, that, that would have scared them too. If somebody knocked on the door, they're in there kind of hiding and uh, they may have thought it would be the Sanhedrin or somebody that was after them. Um, he didn't peek in the door uh, where they could see him standing there. No, he just appeared in their presence. The way that God does things. He just shows up and says, peace be unto you. <laughs> that didn't seem to diminish their alarm. Now, as I read this, it's hard for us to even imagine. Uh, I know today in all the imagery and the, the TV things and the movies we have, we, we see those types of things. But can you imagine being assembled in a room and Jesus just appear right before you? Now, I'm not talking about a ghost. I'm not talking about some faint, fuzzy spirit. I'm talking about in the flesh standing right there before them. The Lord made allowance for their fears. Now what he did first here was he gave them some bodily proof. Some bodily proof. It says in verses 38 through 40, And he said unto them, Why are you troubled? And why did thoughts arise in your hearts? Behold my hands and my feet, that it is I myself. Handle me and see. In other words, touch me. This is real. This is not a spirit. It's me in the flesh. He says... Um, for a spirit hath not flesh and bones, as ye see me have. And when he had thus spoken, he showed them his hands and his feet. Hey, there was tangible evidence there. Uh, tangible. This was not a phony spirit body. This was him in the flesh. This is the same body, uh, the same that they saw crucified on a cross and, and buried in a, in, in a grave one day. But they still weren't fully convinced. It goes on to say in verses, now it seems to me that would be pretty good evidence, but it was still struggle. Uh, they struggled with that. It's still troubling to them. Look what it says in verse 41. And while they yet believed not for joy and wondered, <laughs> he showed them his hands and his feet. He would asked them to handle him, touch that physical body, so that they would know it was real. And they still struggled. And he knew that. He said unto them, Have you here any meat? And they gave him a piece of rolled fish and honeycomb. And he took it and did eat before them. Jesus asked, I like this, he asked for meat. He didn't ask for a salad. He asked for some solid food. And he was going to consume that, that they might be able to see and believe that it was not a spirit. He's able to sit down at the table and eat solid food. Another positive uh, example of proof that he was given these doubtless uh, disciples at that time. So he gave them a bodily proof. He gave them the evidence, physical evidence that they would need. But he also gave them a biblical proof. Look what it says in the first part of verse 44. And he said unto them, These are the words which I spake unto you while I was yet with you. After 
Peter's great confession at um, Caesarea Philippi, he, he had repeatedly told them exactly what was going to happen to him. He'd shared with them. He told them what was going to take place. Every detail had been fulfilled over the past week. All the things that he said would come to pass had come to pass. Furthermore, he reinforced his teaching uh, in the upper room by pointing them back to the Bible. Look what he says as, as you go on in verse 44. That in all things, that all things must be fulfilled which were written in the law of Moses and in the prophets and in the Psalms concerning me. This was a, basically a threefold, you might say, a division of the Hebrew Bible. The whole Jewish Bible spoke of him and he endorsed each and every part of it. Then Lucas says verse 45. Then opened he their understanding, that they might understand the Scriptures. Hey, they needed some spiritual enlightenment, and, and the Lord Jesus helped them understand what he was saying. They needed that spiritual enlightenment. You know, the Bible tells us in 1 Corinthians in chapter 2 and verse 14, it says that the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him. Neither can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. Hey, listen, in my flesh I'm nothing, but with the Spirit of God in my life, the Lord speaks through me, and it can accomplish what's he want, what he wants accomplished. So he gave some, um, not just bodily proof, he gave this um, biblical proof as well. Now, the task that lay before these, these men was, was large. They were to be his ambassadors in a, in a hostile, unbelieving world. It goes on in verse 46. And he said unto them, Thus it is written, and thus it behooved Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead the third day, and that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name, among all nations, beginning at Jerusalem, and ye are witnesses of these things. Their task, what was their task? To evangelize the world. To evangelize the world. He looked at them. I mean, he looked at this unlikely group of people, you might say. A few fishermen, a former tax collector. I mean, think about the guys that he had gathered together. There was not a scholar among them, not even a trained rabbi, you might say. This collection of nobodies was to preach in defiance of the Sanhedrin. This group of supposedly uneducated, this, these, these low-down rascals, you might say, uh, were the ones responsible for getting the gospel around the world. Think about that in the face of the intellectual Greeks and the all-powerful Romans, if we're not careful, we begin to gauge things in that way. And I'll tell you what, anybody with the power of God in their life can accomplish great things for God. Don't limit God. Don't limit God. Only an hour or so earlier... <laughs> They had found it virtually impossible, you might say, to make Christ real to each other. But now things were different. Now it was different. The Lord wasn't quite through, though. Look what it says in verse 49. And behold, I send the promise of my Father upon you. But tear ye in the city of Jerusalem until ye be endued with power from on high. So that was it. Think about it. Think about that. The second person of the Godhead was going home to heaven, but the third person of the Godhead was coming down to earth to take his place in the form of the Holy Spirit. The Lord had no intention of leaving it up to his disciples to formulate the plan and to carry it out on the earth's remotest bounds, you might say. The Holy Spirit would enlighten them and enable them. Thank the Lord. I'm glad when I got saved, the Holy Spirit came to indwell in me. Hey, if there's anything good in me, if there's anything accomplished in this old weak flesh, let me tell you something, it'll be the power of God. It won't be something I've done. And I believe that's what's lacking. I believe we need God's power in our lives. No doubt about it. No doubt about it. 
He would reveal truth to them. He would superintend the, the writings of the, of the New Testament. He would supernaturally open blind eyes and, and deaf ears and raise from spiritual death people who were held in the bondage of sin. That's exactly what took place. And all they had to do right now was wait. Was wait. I was thinking about this before the service. I was over in my office. And I'm not anything. But I'm studying this. I'm getting ready to preach this. And it just kind of, you know, hit me in the face. Like sometimes, you know, a deer in the headlights. I'm like, wow. Huh? Uh, I found myself on my knees praying, asking God to help me. I could come over here in my flesh and talk a little bit. Read a passage of scripture. There'd be nothing to it. But I tell you what, I want God's power. I want God to use what, what goes out as it falls on people's ears and hearts that it'll make a difference in their life. I can't do that, but He can. He can. Right now, all they had to do was wait. Well, Jesus stayed uh, on earth, appearing here and there for those 40 days, and then He took these... Um, people to all of it, you might say, uh, out as far as Bethany where he had spent some of his happiest times. That's where the house of Martha, Mary, and Lazarus was. And uh, that's where Simon the leper lived. And um, the Lord took a last look around and lifted up his hands and blessed them and stepped into the sky. Look at verse 51. Look at verse 51 of our text. Why well, it says verse 50, and he led them out as far as Bethany, and he lifted up his hands and blessed them. And it came to pass while he blessed them, he was parted from them and carried up into heaven. And they worshiped him and returned to Jerusalem with great joy. Wow. The last they saw of him, he was blessing them. The last they saw of him, he was blessing them. And the last he saw of them, they were worshiping him. Isn't that interesting? He was blessing and they were worshiping. Let me tell you something. He's still blessing today. We ought to still be worshiping today. He's meeting our needs every day. We ought to be worshiping Him every day. I mean, whatever form of worship it might be, it might be in song, it might be in praise, it might be in witnessing, it might be in giving, whatever the case may be, we ought to be worshiping Him with everything we have. Because let me tell you, He's still blessing. He's still blessing. Thank the Lord. It's been like that ever since. Jesus blesses us and we worship Him. As for the disciples, of course, it says in verse um, 52, the last part, and 53, returned to Jerusalem with great joy and were continually in the temple praising and blessing God. I thought it was kind of interesting here with great joy. If you remember there in the upper room, uh, they lacked that joy. But they had that joy now. The Jewish leaders didn't like it, uh, but what could they do? The extraordinary things that had happened? Wow, it's incredible. They had to wait and see. Then this countdown begins. These ten days, you might say. And then with a mighty rush and a roar. The Bible tells us in Acts chapter 2 and verse 3. You might want to turn there. Acts chapter 2 and verse 3. And, and let's look at this here for just a moment. Acts 2 verse 3. And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, and they were all with one accord in one place, and suddenly there came a sound from heaven as a rushing mighty wind, and it filled all the house where they were sitting. And there appeared to them cloven tongues like as of fire, and it set upon each one of them, each of them, and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost. They were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Wow, isn't that incredible? I think about the entrance of the Comforter. The Comforter has come. John 14, 26 says, But the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance whatsoever I have said unto you. Jesus promised his disciples only days before that God would send his Spirit, the Comforter, unto them, unto the world. This was simply a restatement of promises that were delivered 
hundreds of years before that. The Bible tells us in Isaiah chapter 44 and verses 2 and 3, it says, Thus saith the Lord that made thee and formed thee from the womb, which will I help thee. Fear not, O Jacob, my servants, and thou Jezron, whom I have chosen, for I will pour water upon him that is thirsty and floods of, as floods upon the dry ground. I will pour my spirit upon thy seed and my blessings upon thine offspring. Joel 2, 28 and 29 also makes reference to it. And it shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. And your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your old men shall dream dreams. Your young men shall see visions. And also upon the servants and upon the handmaids in those days will I pour out my spirit. Wow. That was literally took place, literally happened there on the day of Pentecost when the disciples were filled with the Holy Spirit of God. It says in Acts chapter 1, Acts chapter 1 and verse 8, we talk about the Great Commission. But ye shall receive power. When do you receive power? After the Holy Ghost is come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and unto the uttermost parts of the earth. Wow, that's the entrance. We see the entrance of the, the comfort. And I look at the extent of his ministry. I think about the Holy Spirit. Is the Holy Spirit just for a select few people? Just for a few of those in the church? No. The Bible tells us in Romans chapter 8, verses 9 through 11, it says, Be ye are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit. If so be that the Spirit of God dwell in you, now, if any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he is none of his. And if Christ be in you, the body is dead because of sin, but the Spirit is life because of righteousness. But if the Spirit of him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwell in you, he that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken your mortal bodies by his Spirit that dwelleth in you. Hallelujah. You trusted Christ as your Savior? The Holy Spirit came and indwelt you at that time. Now notice here the ex exhortation to Christians. If we're to experience, I believe, God's presence and God's power in our worship, and whether it's public or private, uh, we have got to have God's provision along the way. We've got to allow God to do all that He wants to do in our lives. God wants us, God, God wants to fill us with His Spirit. God's promise is fulfilled here when, when He says that. When He told them, when He left and said to, to go and to tarry until, then that took place. Now, now look at the source here. Look, look at God's power. We see God's promise and look at God's power and how it's revealed. You know, in ourselves, we're weak and can do nothing. Romans seven eighteen, For I know that in me that is in my flesh, dwelleth no good thing. Now, I'll think about that thought a minute. In my flesh dwelleth no good thing. I kid people a lot of times. It's just kind of a joke, but someone, you say, how you doing? They say, I'm doing good. Well, the Bible says not. It says there's no good thing. Now, I don't say that to be critical, just a little cliche you might say, but for I know that in me, that is in my flesh, dwelleth no good thing. We realize that. Then it goes on to say, for to will is present with me, but how to perform that which is good, I find not. If there's any power in any person this evening, it's a direct result of, of, of the Holy Spirit's feeling and indwelling in our lives. I know what the Bible says, Philippians 4, 13. I can do all things. Amen. But it goes on to say, through Christ Jesus. Through Christ Jesus. You know, Ephesians 3, 20 says this here. Now unto him that is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think, according to the power that worketh in us. What is that power? That's the power of the Holy Spirit. Well, we need to get a hold of that. We need to pray and beg God. We need to spend time with Him and, and be filled with the Holy Spirit of God that we can accomplish what He wants us to do. You know, I was reading about Jonathan Edwards, that great sermon in 
titled Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God. <laughs> that sermon, that one sermon had a tremendous impact in the 1700s in, in New England. And um, there's still rippling effects today because of that one sermon. Many know about it. Many know about the 500 souls that were saved in that service and the manifest power of God, you might say. But not as many are quite as understanding as to why the success of that sermon. It seemed like a few people there in the same village were concerned about a move of God in another village nearby. They were hearing of the wonderful things God was doing over there in, in that little town, and they were afraid that their little humble town would be passed by in revival. Now, just that thought, that thought itself encourages me. Here's a group of people didn't want to miss out on revival. They didn't want to miss out on God doing a mighty work in their lives. So what they do? They spend the entire night before this great sermon was preached on their knees in prayer that God would manifest His power in their community. God answered. Now, in spite of Jonathan Edwards' style, I mean, we, we, were, we live in a day and age of entertainment. We want to be entertained. Uh, Jonathan Edwards, he spoke in a high, squeaky voice. It said uh, he held his notes so closely to his face uh, where his eyes could see them that you couldn't see his face. Yet God took that not charismatic person, not well-dressed person. God took that person that had to power God on his life and did a wonderful, wonderful work. Look at the scope of his power. No limit to the power of Almighty God. He has the ability to do whatever He wants to do. Matthew 28 and verse 18. Matthew 28 verse 18. And Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. All power is given unto Him. Then He says, Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you alway, even unto the end of the world. Amen. God's power can soften the hardest heart. I tell you what, he can, God's power can move the, the, the largest, biggest mountains that might be for you. That's what the power of God can do. Oh, we limit him. We limit him so much. You know, I don't know about you, I, I love to hear about the past, and I, I love the testimonies of old, but I appreciate what Pastor Swore said, and, and I've shared this in our church uh, from time to time. Um, it's, it's wonderful to hear about what God did, but I want God to do. I want to experience God doing great and mighty things right now. I'm glad that 50 years ago or 200 years ago this and such happened. That's wonderful, but I want the power of God in my life, in this church, that will do something great for God right now. And that'll happen when we get endued with His power. Oh my goodness. I want to experience those things in the day we're living. God's power. Look at God's plan really quick here. God's plan. God's plan right now for them involved tarrying. The word tarry simply means to sit down. Jesus told His disciples to sit down until they were filled. How many times do I go off about my day or go off to accomplish something and then stop and realize, I didn't pray. I, I, I didn't spend time or very much time with the Lord. And we wonder why we stumble and fall and have mediocre results in things we're trying to accomplish. How did they spend the 10 days between this command and the actual feeling? It tells us in Acts chapter 1 and verse 14. In that span of time that he says to tarry until, it's about a 10 day period, what did they do? Acts 1 14 says, these all continued with one accord in prayer and supplication with the women and Mary the mother of Jesus and with his brethren. Wow. 
waiting for God to fill them for service. Oh, that we get to a place we'd cry out to God to be, to be merciful and to uh, endure us so that we may be able to accomplish what He wants done. I'm afraid our prayer life's short and sweet. I'm afraid our prayer life is a lot like our prayer meal sometimes. Lord, thank you for the food. Amen. Mm. We need God's power. I believe it's one critical element missing in the church today. Those that are willing to sacrifice the time. You have to get rid of something in your life to have the time to pray. You may turn something off. may to close something up. You may have to just stop an activity to have time to pray so we can have that power. You know, I read about the great revivalist Charles Finney. He was always preceded um, in every campaign by a man by the name of Daniel Nash. Nash joined Finney as a 48-year-old preacher who had experienced uh, little success as a pastor. Nash, who was called Father Nash, would come to town three or four weeks ahead of Finney and would find a hotel room where he could stay. He would hole up in that room and call on God for power for Finney until the meetings were ended. He rarely went to the service because he felt better served um, by being in prayer. He died in 1831, and within four months, Finney had stopped his revival services and had taken up pastoral work. He didn't have the same success without Nash, without the man who was willing to tarry on the Lord. Oh, that we had some people that were willing to tarry on the Lord. Call on Him in prayer. Spend time with Him. Let me tell you something. If you decide to tarry for the Lord, there's some things going to take a back seat. There's some things you won't get done. There's some activities that may have to go away. I think about where we are right now. <laughs> there's a lot of activities that have gone away. A lot of things are different now. What a wonderful time in the pandemic we have with all that's going on would be that God's people would just get serious and pray. See what God will do. Oh, we want our problem fixed. We want our finances fixed. We want back to work. We want health. We, we desire all those things. But what about the power of God? If we just get the power of God in our lives, the cost of God's plan, the consequences, the disciples were willing to tarry before the Lord so they were endued with His power. <laughs> They literally changed the world through the power in their lives. Um, don't you want to see that? Don't you want to be endued with that power? See sinners saved, homes salvaged, lives reclaimed. We see God do that. Don't you want to see more? Don't you want to call on Him and get His help, and get His strength, and get His power? Have you ever tarried before the face of God until He filled you with His power? Have you ever, have you ever knelt down to pray and got up and started to walk away and think, I don't have it, and just go right back and kneel down and say, God, I need you. We want to get up in our own power. We want to say our own little prayer and get up and go. And you get back on your knees and then it just gets real sweet then. You get the play out of the way. And now we're getting real with God. God, I need you. Lord, do a work. Lord, you're amazing. You're wonderful. You deserve all praise. And I mean, just get serious with God and let Him fill you with His power. You know... Uh, I want you. I want you this evening. It might be unusual there in your home. You may be there by yourself, maybe a couple, maybe children. I don't know. But it'd be good 
Pastor Mike's going to have prayer time too, just a little bit. It'd be good if as a family, you'd pray that God would work in your family. It'd be good that you'd pray for America and its sin-sick condition. It'd be good if you'd pray concerning this pandemic and this virus. I mean, spend some time and ask God to give you His power and work through your life. He can take a bad situation and do a whole lot of good with it. Let's seek His power. Maybe someone listening, and you don't have the power of God, you don't have the Holy Spirit indwelling you because you've never trusted Christ. Won't you trust Him before it's too late? Call on His name for salvation. He has all power. He can help you through your situation. Now don't trust Him to, 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 get, to get your fix. Don't trust Him to try to clean up your act. No, 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 no. Trust Him because you realize without Him, you're going to spend eternity in a place called hell. Trust Him because He's the only one that can get you to heaven. Trust that He's the only one that can forgive you of your sins. The Bible says, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. The Bible says, for the wage of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Oh, won't you call on Him? Jesus loves you. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever, that could be you, whosoever believeth on Him should not perish but have everlasting life. I want to encourage you, call on Jesus as your Savior if you've not done that. Christian, let's get endued with power. Let's spend some time at the throne begging God to meet our needs and to help us. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we love You. Thank You for Your Word. In Luke chapter 24, God, I pray you'd bless it. I pray, Lord, we'd be all you want us to be. Lord, pour your power out amongst your people. Lord, I pray we'd have the strength to accomplish what you want done in our lives. Bless this little church, God. Meet every need. Just do abundantly above what we could ask or think. I know you're able to. We love you. If someone's lost, I pray they call on you before it's eternally too late. Thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you so much for, for worshiping and with us tonight. I, I trust that was a blessing. And uh, make sure you enjoy your prayer time that will follow and also in our other services as they come up. And be praying for America and praying for those that are on the front line, those that are in the essential parts of business right now. And uh, they need your help. Let's pray that God will help them. God bless you, and we'll see you the next time.